every yeah. single electronic voting machine that we have in the state of Kentucky, I would be overreaching to stay nationally, but the voting machines we have in the state of Kentucky, in my opinion, are unconstitutional. The chickens are coming home to roost because we've kicked God out of our schools. We've raised three generations, I would say now, of people that don't believe in God or don't want to be responsible or obey rules and things like that. America used to have the top schools in the world. Now we've got one of the worst because we've gotten rid of discipline, right and wrong. It's just a disaster. And we have a huge number of murders and sexually transmitted diseases. If they could watch the rest of this movie, you would see that the businesses are moving out of Seattle. That's exactly what happens. So taxation starts to increase, and then the big businesses move out of town. And then that's when the homelessness increases all the more. This just starts festering on itself. And they say, okay, now we need to borrow money from the state. Now we need to borrow money from the country. Borrow money you know? from you and me, from everything. Right now, there was a good effort that was given. It's still in play right now. I just don't see it lasting forever. And that is they put the Bible in the classroom as a history course. The motive for this was to get Christian school kids to come into public schools saying, we'll have these traded in electives and you can take that here. Now that we have a new governor elected, Andy Bashir is very unlikely with his control over the education to keep that going. His father, the former governor, was famous for kicking the Ten Commandments out of the classroom. That will probably go by the wayside. But there's something that was very interesting I was studying recently. Richard Dawkins, infamous in our circles, atheist, famous atheist, wrote a book called The God Illusion Against God. And he argued for something in that book about how he was proud of Britain because they have the Bible, the King James Bible, in curriculum as English literature. And he said that that was essential for the history of English civilization because not only do you have the Bible itself, but you have all these dramas and plays that use yeah, Bible references, yeah. all these history and the government and everything like that. The Bible permeates all this stuff. He said, have it put in as literature. To put it in as literature as curriculum, that means that you can't argue whether or not it's true. So what? It's yeah. still literature. You can't be offended because it says one thing or another because you're not saying it's endorsing it. You're just saying, here's a story. In high school, I was taught stuff like Beowulf and stuff like Shakespeare, and they had a much higher vocabulary, much more archaic language than the King James Bible does. This is something that's easier to read than those things that would encourage learning and literature and history and world civ and all that kind of stuff. And yet, sneak in that thing called morality that helps people with wisdom, have the kids read Proverbs. There's really nothing that you could argue against this when you got the world's currently most famous atheist saying, this is what we do. I don't think Brashear will be able to take anything out of the schools because it would require a law. And he's a lame duck governor because he has no Senate, no House of Representatives. So he may try to take... I agree with you on the economics, but I was thinking that the governor had more direct control. The Supreme Court can decide. That's what Brashear did when he took the Ten Commandments out. He said, oh, this is unconstitutional to teach children right and wrong. So it's unconstitutional to get rid of it. So they went through all the high schools in the whole state, ripped all the Ten Commandments off the wall. But the president has put some people on the Supreme Court that I think would stop that. Mm -hmm. Now, today, I'm hoping that they will get maybe one more on and they can stop baby killing. Maybe. I don't know. Of course, it's in God's hands. It just shows, in my estimation, that when you get rid of God, you have all of this lawlessness, lack of learning, sexually transmitted diseases, and all the crime, it seems to me it's all coming home to roost. And 
The other thing, it seems to me, it's important for everyone who believes in God or doesn't want people using their sidewalk or their restroom. If you don't like that, you better vote right because everything is coming down to how you vote. And if you vote for these people that say, oh, no, there's nothing right and wrong and just let them do whatever they want and we're not going to put them in, in jail. Now, at the end of this movie, did you get to see the whole thing? Most of it. At the very end, they've got a story about Baltimore. In Baltimore, they finally woke up enough to say, hey, this is a problem. We're going to force these people to either stop breaking the law or else they're going to put them in prison or else they'll have to get some kind of drug rehab program which is basically the methadone program, methadone, yeah. which means they just substitute one drug for another. The coverage of that video, you could tell a little bit of worldview difference. I think that these ideas like, well, let's just put more drugs, more psychology and stuff. These are things to kind of slow down the problem. Society's not going to improve that way. It's just going to say, oh, we're just going to stop it right there. Like oh. a freeze. Oh, no, somebody's coming to rob my house. I got it. I'll pay them off. Well, if you pay them off, what happens when they go out and party and they say, well, that was pretty good. Oh, let's come back for more. It just delays it. It is true that it would be better to have some solution than no solution. But that's where we're at. We're in a society that's hitting that no solution level. They don't want to admit anybody who's been around for a while knows that there was no drug problem, no homelessness problem, none of these problems until they got rid of Bible and prayer. Anybody can put two and two together and say, maybe we ought to go back the way it was. I think there's a verse in the Bible that they specifically want to rip out that puts the whole point of this. Jesus said that you cannot serve two masters. God yeah. and mammon, and mammon is like the deity of money. What happens is people realize, if I suppress everybody else and make them my slaves and steal and rape and pillage everything they yeah. got, and I'll be stinking rich. And so they think, I'd rather be stinking rich than have not only everybody poor or whatever, but everybody well off. I'd rather not have everybody well off. I'd rather personally be stinking rich. That's what happens with these crooked governments? Unbelievable. You look at this video, it reminded me of a video I saw about Venezuela, and the children were following the dump truck to try to get garbage out of the dump truck so they'd have something to eat because it's just big government, high inflation, and no one can buy anything. The whole mm -hmm thing is going to pieces. This morning, there was a report of stabbings out on London Bridge out in England. It was kind of hilarious because in England, you're not allowed to have any guns. So you're not allowed to have guns. Police officers are not normally supposed to have guns. And yet they also let a lot of the Muslims kind of go a little bit wild. They let them kind of have Sharia law. So there's a lot more terrorist activity. So these guys were not allowed to have guns. So this guy ran around with fake dynamite strapped to his chest, and then he had like a knife and he ran around stabbing people. Eventually, some of the cops finally went and they shot him, grabbed a gun, and they shot him. And so CNN's sitting there. The good guys killed the bad guy with a gun, and they're sitting there. They were able to stop the terrorists from real bombings and real gun stuff. He did pretty good. Those gun laws saved the day. At the end of the day, Realizing, hold on, somebody went out and killed some more people and didn't stop anybody <laughs> from killing more people. Since that guy's not afraid of getting shot, he said, hey, I can go and kill more people because this was a repeat offense. Some other guys planned the exact same attack just a year ago. And so they said, OK, well, he could do it so I can do it. All these different groups are just finding different ways to kill people. Stabbings are like an epidemic in Britain. You don't have to have a gun to kill people. That's right. You can kill people with your bare hands. So what are we going to do? Have everybody walk around as mummies? 
oh, that way nobody's killing each other. It's great. That's what they do. They say, let's have a tyranny. It's going to be great. Unbelievable. So they were afraid he was going to blow everybody up because it yeah. looked like yeah, he they had Yeah, did, they didn't want to approach him because it looked like he had dynamite there. And since it was a copycat thing, they do believe it was terroristic. At least like the report I heard this morning. Never know how, how it's going to turn out at the end. This is just something that just keeps on going on. And they know why they like it because they have this system of let's have an excuse to have more government. If we have more government, we can steal more money from the yeah. taxpayers. Ron Paul, when he was in office, he had a sign on his desk do not steal. The government does not like the competition. Competition. That sounds good. I think it just comes back that we need God in our schools. Hopefully, well, we'll get him back in again. This also requires us to be more responsible people. Even people who are Christians or Republicans or people on the right, whatever you want to call yourself, we are starting to slack off. We need to kind of have a society where families are not afraid to discipline their kids. They say, spare the rod. If you have to take that literally, go ahead. Don't break the kid, but if that kid is going to go off and go to school and start beating up his teacher, like certain people, like That's a block exactly away from right. where I live, if they're going to go and start going crazy like that, then yes, discipline your kid. Preachers need to start preaching out of the Bible, because honestly, this is where, oh, why are we having all these Christians vote Democrat? Why? Because they're not focused on the Bible. They're not preaching through the Bible. Right teaching the Bible. They have their own little agendas and all this life coach and all that kind of stuff. No. They want to say, oh, I'm preaching doctrine. Let the Bible teach the doctrine. Preach the Bible. The Word of God will change people's hearts. It seems to me that in America today, we have a two-party system. There are two parties. And one is for America and for God and for morality and for life, and the other party is against God, against life, against morality, and for more and more taxes. I wish we lived back in the day where I could look at you and say, no, Frank, you're presenting a false dichotomy. I wish you were not telling the truth, but you're telling exactly the truth. When they say they hate our country, it's because they'll say, we hate our country. This is what they're doing. It mm -hmm. is breaking down that simple, and I wish it wasn't. I wish we were just having a conversation. But while we have our conversation, other people are not having it so good. Well, Matt Singleton, I appreciate you being on the program and giving us some insight on this situation. We're about out of time, so please tune in again next week for the rest of the news. Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Simon. I'm an allergist and family doctor, board certified in both allergy and internal medicine. I specialize in allergy, headaches, sinus, hives, cough, asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. We're located at 1404 Browns Lane near Norton Suburban Hospital. Our phone number is 895-5088. We can see you tomorrow. Okay, this is Frank Simon with the rest of the news. Thank you for tuning in. And our special guest is Chris Stibbs from the Citizens for Election Integrity. And our other special guests are Cindy Marlowe and John Brewer. Hello. Okay, good. Chris is with the Citizens for Election Integrity, and we're going to talk with her a little bit about this November 5th election because there's a lot of suspicious things going on. We're not really going to try to change the election results, but we do want to see if we have a election voting system that actually works. Chris, how did you get into all of this? Well, somewhat by accident. Erica Callahan's a very good friend of mine. Um, he's also a very good friend of mine. We have always been similar in our thinking. One's more kind of libertarian. One is independent bending. I'm registered Republican. But we're all very much kind of clear thinkers. And when this issue came up and some of the evidence started being shared here, there, and everywhere, I was married to a high-level IT professional, white hat, ethical hacker level person. He's done FBI 
bank auditing and so on. We saw some of this stuff come around. It was more than a casual interest. It was something when you see vulnerability unchecked, it just was worth stepping in. So CFEI was formed and we just keep on moving forward. We have help from attorneys. This will network into a nationwide movement. And so this is really just kind of how the Kentucky part started. I've talked with Don Hodgkins, is it? Hodgson. Mm -hmm. Hodgson. Do you know him? I'm familiar with him. I've gotten to know him a little bit just in the last few days. I haven't really known him at all in the past. Dr. Simon, you want to ask her what the five-point legislation? Are you still there? Yes. And that's what he is doing right now. He's in Frankfurt. I am just a citizen out in the middle of Bluegrass, Kentucky. (laughs) He's spearheading in Frankfurt a response to everything that we've all seen. And he's got a five-point legislative agenda. First, clean the voter registration rules, which I think you've heard Mike Adams talk about. A voter ID law, that would be the second point. The third point is very important, a human-readable paper ballot. It's got to be countable. It's got to be countable in public. It's very important these ballots do not get destroyed at any point in the process within the federal law. I think the federal guideline is 22 months. So no ballot destruction. So human-readable paper ballots, that's number three. Number four, public disclosure of all contracts for voting machines and anything connected to Board of Elections stuff. And number five is requiring an automatic recount when there's any margin of victory under a half a percent. We also talked about eliminating straight party voting, which I think is under one of these other points that would be in legislative action. You don't really need a picture ID to vote in Kentucky now? As far as what I have seen, there are five acceptable forms of identification, and one of them did not have a photo on it. But again, I wouldn't be the one to confirm that. But we do have ID laws. I have worked the polls before. If you have the ability, if you're a regular poll worker and you can identify your next door neighbor and you know that's that person, a personal identification does also work in the state of Kentucky, but that's not a commonality. I also know that my wife had the unusual experience of losing her purse the day before the election and everything worked out. We got it the next day, but we went to the polls without any ID. Things she could actually bring was bill that had her address on it. One of the things that they said, oh, well, you can go as a credit card. Well, of course, that was in her purse as well. That is true, though, and that's the one form that I saw today as I was scanning over documentation that did not have a photo on it. That's the one which that's a very loose statute, and I think that is part of this five-point legislative agenda is to require that photo ID. A picture voter ID. Chris, are you there? I am, yeah. I lost you for a second. Yep, I'm here. A picture voter ID. Yes, a picture, a photo ID. In fact, my local county clerk would be Johnny Collier in Justman County. Johnny stated to me the other day that he feels that personal identification is one of the greatest vulnerabilities. Someone can say they know them and they don't. They just have it set up that people can come in and vote, and they're Mm -hmm. not even in the precinct. I don't agree with that either, even if you really do know your neighbor. You need to show me your ID. Let's go on with John's wife. Let me ask you something, Chris. Are you saying that you can use a bill, an electric bill? I don't know that that's actually legal. I think that the forms of identification, you can bring your Social Security card. Assume that a concealed carry with a photo would be fine. The credit card. But I do not think that there was a printed bill on the list. That's not my expertise. I think that's a big, big, big problem because they say they know people because they're Mm -hmm. voting with the same party, and that takes care of it. That's why you get precincts with 90% all voting the same way, because it's very corrupt, I think. I've heard lots of horror stories. Clean up the voter roll. They told Allison Grimes over and over again, they finally took her to court and told her to take all those dead people off the voter rolls, and she refused to do it. That came from Tom Fitton in Judicial Watch. That's actually correct. That was an agreement that Fitton actually made public about April or May this year. And I believe it was about August that that was supposed to happen. And then the Attorney General and Grimes sued the state of Kentucky 
I believe in September and in October, those 175,000 were restored. Put all those dead people back on the rolls. Well, we don't know if they were all dead. Many of them may have moved out, but the 175,000 were restored. Now, I will tell you, statistically, when Allison Lundergan Grimes took office, I think it's here, Election Day 2014, 18 counties in Kentucky had more dead people on the rolls than there were people with heartbeats in those counties. In 2016, two years later, that number rose from 18 counties to 41 counties. And last year in 2018, under Grimes, we went from 18 in 2014 to 58 of our 120 counties have more dead people on the rolls than there are people registered that have beating hearts in their chest. I don't understand why we were discussing this in the office. If when someone dies, it should be very easy to take, take it off, off the, the roll. Should be, yes, I agree. And I talked to our local, again, I really respect our Johnny Collier here in Jessamine County. Somebody else today said probably one of the most labor-intensive jobs that these people have as county clerks is keeping registrations correct. I don't know if the problems in those counties, pure speculation as to why there are problems, but if they need a court order to have it done for them, then so be it. If not, then perhaps they just should start cleaning before they're forced to do it. When my husband passed away, his check immediately, because he was on Social Security, not got his check that month, even though he passed away before the actual date of the check. So they made sure he didn't get his check, but yet they're not going to make sure he's still not on the voting road. And he's still on there. I know he was off at one time. It didn't matter how he got back on there, but the point is, if he's on there, they should immediately kick out. There should be a red flag saying this social security number, person's deceased. It should be an automatic flag. Our little machines at our office, we have a server and we can filter things out. And we're a very small nonprofit. I just don't believe it. It can't be that labor intense. This is the thing that we're starting to get to now in our discussion is that computers have a great use for different things like we're talking about. Clean a voter roll based upon death certificates and so on and so forth. The one thing a computer is not good for is voting. We need to remove yeah. the... How many people that listen to your show have ever had a computer give them the blue screen of death? Hmm. Have ever had their phone... Exactly. Die, ...had something that they've reserved online or have done something online and then go pick something up and have that fail? We have it happen all the time. It's a commonality. The inception of these machines in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, up until now, people initially thought they were foolproof, and now we're not that dumb. We know that machines fail. Yes, we can use machines for cleaning up voter rolls, tracking data, but for voting, no. We Absolutely. need a voting system, paper ballots, we count paper ballots, and we do not allow destruction of paper ballots under the federal law. There was a number of articles, at least one article, and the New York Times saying in Pennsylvania lately they had a complete failure of their voting machines. I think it was a judge got 165 votes. It turns out it was 160,000. That happened in Northampton County, Pennsylvania. That right. is a big issue right now. What's very interesting, I rest on my IT professional who discovered that a group very similar to ours in September this year, petitioned the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to decertify that machine with a laundry list of reasons. And Pennsylvania went ahead then, and they had an IT security audit of the machines, which was done by a very poorly rated security company with questionable ownership. We're investigating this. The long and short of it is Pennsylvania recertified those machines Every point that they questioned, the security team had passed the audit, and the machine was recertified, and then we see the failure, major failure in Northampton yeah. County. It was almost prophetic what the group had put out there, and they answered it post-election. No, no, it wasn't post-election. They answered the audit pre-election. That issue alone right there, what happened with that chain of events, should be enough in the entire United States of America never to use a digital voting machine ever again. There shouldn't have to be another thing said than following that chain of events. So we're going to try to get the voter rolls cleaned up so they're not full of dead people. Then we're going to require 
a picture voter ID, we're going to have paper ballots. That are preserved. Recount. Don't forget the automatic recount under a half. Oh, yeah. Automatic recount. If it's less than a half percent. percent. But don't you think we also need to make sure these people are citizens of the United States and citizens well, I think of each state? that has to do state? with your identification process because I don't believe we have any sanctuary cities in the state of Kentucky. Oh, yes, we oh, do. Yes, we do. Is a Jefferson County, yes, sir. Yes. They don't say it is, but it is. They don't officially say it by statute. We should not have anybody with a driver's license that is not a legal U.S. That's not true. Well, I know people who are over here. I know them personally. And they have been over here with a driver's license, and they've been on the voter roll. That is true. Well, that is an issue. We need to try to get that cleaned up, too. And mm-hmm. what did you say about all public contracts? What kind of contracts were they? These would be contracts like, for example, Heart InterCivic, es any contract, for example, if they should, for some reason, decide to stay digital and have security measures with independent security auditing firms. Any contracts that are handed out or awarded in any of this would have to be a public disclosure. That's part of it. it says here that anything for maintaining voter machines, any aggregation machines, any software and cloud connections would be under that point of legislation. That covers also who are looking at the CIDL company and the one that's headquartered in Spain used to transmit voter data. If you eliminate the digital systems, you eliminate CIDL. That's hey, what we no, need to do. We don't need anybody coming in and taking our stuff to another yeah, country and bringing it, it back. To send all of our votes to Spain mm-hmm. before they can be counted. Especially at one point that was said that George Soros owned that. I haven't verified any of that. I don't want to speak to anything that I haven't verified. I was considering the FDIC bank audits that my husband has done for years. And when you realize that every single bank that carries the FDIC insurance guarantee has to have annual security audits, including full IT of every system in their every connection they have to the internet and so on, very thorough, and it's a requirement annually, keep their FDIC insurance. I don't think anybody would want a bank somewhere that didn't have that, but the government makes that a priority. Do you know what security mandates there are for auditing security for the vote? Zero, nothing. I wonder why. That's my thought question out there. And why wouldn't you? I began looking through a lot of the precincts. And one thing I will tell you is when you start looking through these things precinct by precinct, you start to really appreciate the, that's a person's voice. To violate our vote in any way is egregious. It is un-American, and I really feel that it's imperative on all of us. I don't care which side you vote on. We have our partisan choices, but when you go and you fill out a ballot, that is our constitutional right. And as I said, the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that the voter's right extends to being able to vote, being able to vote without restriction or discrimination, and then to know your vote was counted and free from fraud.